네, 변전무님께서는 JP모건 등 글로벌 유수의 은행과 증권사 등에서 20년 넘게 외환 딜러로 직접 활동하고 계십니다. 대표적인 국제금융 외환 전문가이십니다. 자, 이렇게 뵙게 돼서 굉장히 반갑습니다. 네, 안녕하세요. 예, 사전에 이번 컨퍼런스를 위해서 많이 예서 주신 걸로 제가 알고 있거든요. 대단히 감사합니다. 자 오늘 인터뷰 어, 뉴욕대학교 데이빗 여맥 교수와 함께 진행을 하셨다고 알고 있는데요. 어떤 분인지 한번 소개를 해 주시겠습니까? 네, 그 데이빗 여맥 교수님은 요 현재 그 뉴욕대학교 스턴 비즈니스 스쿨이라고 있지 않습니까? 네, 스턴 비즈니스 스쿨은 미국에서 그 펜실베니아 왓튼 스쿨과 더불어서 양대 가장 유명한 금융교육기관으로 이렇게 인정받고 있는데요. 월가가 있는 뉴욕의 중심에서 이제 20년 넘게 뉴욕 대학에서 교편을 잡고 계시고요. 또한 그 연준의 자문위원을 오래 하셨습니다. 그래서 연준에 대해서 굉장히 해박하시고 특히나 현재도 그 CBDC나 여러 그 관련 업무에서 그 여러 기관들에게 자문을 이렇게 해주고 계시고요. 특히나 그 어, 여러분에서 그 해박하시기도 하지만 굉장히 그 객관적이시고 또 재미있게 이렇게 설명을 해주세요. 그래서 저희 그, 그 CBDC 이번 그 컨퍼런스에 잘 맞을 걸로 이렇게 생각을 하고 있습니다. 네, n y u 스턴의 여맥 교수님과 인터뷰를 하셨는데요. 이번 인터뷰는 어떤 방식으로 좀 진행이 됐을까요? 네, 그좀 전에 그 안유아 교수님 그 강의 굉장히 인상 깊게 잘 들었고요. 감사하게 잘 들었지만 이제 중국과 미국은 좀 약간 그 CBDC의 지금 그 개발 상황이 좀 다릅니다. 중국은 거의 발행 지금 단계 바로 전인 4단계 파일럿 시범 운영 단계이지만 그 미국 같은 경우에는 지금 연구 단계 있거든요. 그렇기 때문에 저희가 좀 저희가 원하는 그 질문들, 궁금한 사항들을 이렇게 제가 질문 형식으로 교수님께 여쭤봤습니다. 네, NYU의 데이빗 여맥 교수와 변종규 전부님의 인터뷰 영상으로 만나 보겠습니다. 안녕하세요, 프로페서 유르맥. 저는 매우 기쁘고 영광스럽게 여러분을 모시고 있는 교수님의 인터뷰를 하고 있습니다. 감사합니다. 제가 여기에 와서 이 강의를 하고 있습니다. 프로페서 유르맥, 이 강의에 대해서 한 CBDC 강의가 있었습니다. 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 Of the new digital currency represent a highly significant innovation in the U.S. dollar. What will be the most important incentive for the U.S. government to adopt CBDC when the U.S. dollar is already a dominant currency in the world? I think the U.S. is basically facing competition for the first time in many, many years, and it's being dragged into this maybe against its will. Many other countries are beginning to innovate in this area, and probably the most significant project is the Chinese central bank digital currency that is already active. But you see projects at the European Central Bank. There is a live central bank digital currency already in the Caribbean area, in the Bahamas, and in some other countries. You see one in Nigeria. And if the U.S. does not innovate in this area, it in the long run could be a real threat to having people abandon the dollar and use other payment instruments that have basically better affinity for the public. Um, the system that the U.S. has now is a pretty clunky system. It takes a long time to make payments. <laughs> If you're making payments overseas, it's measured in days. And the amount of cost involved in error checking and cybersecurity and so forth really is a drag on the whole economy. So a lot of modernization has been occurring in the payment space over the last 10 or 15 years. I think the U.S. is late to the game, but it can't afford not to look at the technologies that pretty much all the other countries are already looking at. I would also add that a lot of the competition could come from private companies. If you look at what happened in China, I think Tencent has been extremely successful, first with launching something called the QQ coin that goes back almost 20 years, even before Bitcoin. And then more recently with the WeChat pay system, there's also the Alipay system. But the Chinese central bank government or central bank digital currency 
very much in response to successful payment systems rolled out in the private sector by big media companies. And I think if you look to the Western economies, there's every chance that Google, Apple, Amazon, you know, the companies that have billions of customers could begin creating money of their own and compete with the central banks. So I think the U.S. sees itself as facing competition, not only from other countries, but probably even more so from the big media companies. And it needs to modernize its own payment system to keep up. Thank you very much. Indeed, there's a, a various uh, benefits by doing so. Uh, the second question we have is that the CBDC would differ from existing digital money already available to the public in that CBDC will be a liability of the Federal Reserve, not of a commercial bank or a financial company. What are the potential impacts on financial institutions such as commercial banks and big tech companies, you just said, once the US CBDC is adopted and how that would change our future financial system? I think this is very threatening to the commercial banks and it's not clear that we would even need them in the future. If you look at how money is created today, probably 80 to 90% of it is created by commercial banks, basically by lending money out and creating balances under the fractional reserve system. So when I take out a mortgage to buy my house or a car loan or an education loan, banks basically have the authority to create that money within limits specified by the government. Banks haven't done a very good job of that. That's why we had the <laughs> financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Banks basically make a lot of bad loans and are vulnerable to bank runs and require deposit insurance from the government. It's, it's a very costly system that has been a big problem really for thousands of years. The first bank run was in ancient Rome. And <laughs> this is a problem that's never been well resolved. But when people started thinking about central bank digital currency, the first blueprints from this came out of the Bank of England in a series of academic papers sometime around 2013, 2014. And they basically raised the issue of why do we need to have money created by the fractional reserve lending of commercial banks? Why not just let the public bank directly at the central bank? So that rather than having an account in the US, the big banks would be Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citigroup, mm -hmm. JP Morgan. Rather than keeping an account there, somebody like me could just have an account at the central bank, right at the Federal Reserve. And we wouldn't need banks to play the role of an intermediary and to be creating money. Now, that is the most extreme version. And it's not clear at all that the US would go for this. Um, it may be that there is a middle ground where the banks keep a role as payment processors or account custodians, you know, maybe even continue to lend out money under the old fractional reserve system. This is going to be a political decision, but one of the options is simply to get rid of the commercial banks entirely. And there are quite a few economists that think this is probably overdue. The banks have really caused a lot of problems in history, especially recent history. <laughs> and if we could put an end to this system and go with something that takes advantage of modern technology, it, it might be best for everybody except the bankers. <laughs> as a 20 year banker myself, I feel guilty myself as well. Okay, the next question is, the design of CBDC. The design of CBDC will be a political choice, of course, reflecting ideas from various stakeholders, such as US Treasury Department, Federal Reserve, and other research institutions. But how do you think the Fed will actually design it? Also, do you think banks will still be able to play as intermediaries? And also if the US CBDC will bear interest or not? which are some of the other important aspects of the structure. Yeah, I think you've raised a number of important points in the question. And when you begin by saying it's a political choice, that's very correct. In the US, the banks are very powerful. And so my expectation is that they will lobby so that this is designed in such a way that protects them and maybe even helps them in, in some sense. So. As I said earlier, the most extreme version is simply to bypass the banking system, mm 
and let the public bank write at the central bank. I don't think the US will go for this. I think the US will go for a much softer system where maybe only the banks themselves handle the central bank digital currency, but the public still has to interact with the banks and keep their accounts there. But what if the US did in fact take all the deposits out of the banking system? Would the banks just disappear? Not necessarily. I think what you would probably see is that banks would still see the opportunity to make money in the credit markets by mm -hmm. writing mortgages, writing car loans and so forth, but they would have to finance themselves differently. You know, right now they finance themselves by taking in consumer deposits. You know, my paycheck every month goes into a bank and then mm -hmm. the bank lends that out to somebody else. I think banks would essentially have to recapitalize their balance sheets and issue long-term debt and long-term equity and have essentially liabilities that match the duration of their assets. Mm -hmm. So when banks make 30-year mortgages, which is standard in the US, they finance that with a short-term demand deposit. And so the mismatch between the duration of the asset and the duration of the liability is what makes you vulnerable to a bank run. But if banks instead issued equity and this equity was priced to reflect the true risk of the lending that they're doing, it might be a much more rational and more stable system. So, you know, how banks react to this is a very interesting question, but it could have the indirect effect of causing them to have a more rational capital structure that's more in line with what we teach at the university. The other question you asked about interest rates, I think is actually the most important issue of all. Exactly. Um, we have a, a high likelihood of negative interest rates, maybe not at the moment when there's high inflation, but I think the trend, you know, certainly over the last 30 or 40 years is unmistakable that negative interest rates really for demographic reasons are probably here to stay for the foreseeable future. And what this means is that you really need to get rid of the paper money one way or another. <laughs> paper money, people in the US, we say you put it under the mattress, you just hide it at home and you earn zero. And if the government needs to pay a negative interest rate, and I think it probably will, um, it's almost imperative that you change the money to some type of electronic form. So I think whether people want it or not, Mm -hmm. Electronic money is coming and paper money will disappear simply because of this question of interest rates having to be negative really for the foreseeable future. And I don't think this will be popular with the public. It's probably going to be very controversial politically. But if the central banks, and I think this is true in Korea, US, Japan, Europe, you know, anywhere you look at, very likely have to pay negative interest rates and um, this will cause the disappearance of paper money and physical money probably sooner rather than later. There's many other benefits to central bank digital currency, but I think this one issue of negative interest rates goes right to the head of the list. Sure. There seems to be uh, certain benefits, but at, uh, some risks at the same time. And I'm also uh, quite relieved to know that the banks will play a certain role going forward as well? Probably. I, I would look to different countries to handle this differently, but banks banks have a lot of political power and I don't underestimate, you know, all of our treasury secretaries pretty much come from Goldman Sachs. And, <laughs> you know, and you can see this in the shape of the regulation. Exactly. This is initiative is moving slower, I think, than expected, uh, but it is one of the biggest a change to ever have in the uh, modern monetary system era. Uh, the next question I have for you is, many countries such as China, UK, Japan, and Korea, and over half of the countries around the world are working on the creation of their own CBDCs. Also in March, President Biden ordered the US government to study digital dollar, and a report is expected to come sometime in September. What is the meaning of this order? And do you think this will quicken and also uh, the, the quicken the creation and also the implementation of the US CBDC? Then when we can expect to start using it? I think the order is mostly symbolic. And the truth is the US was already looking at this and working on it. And it, it doesn't need an order from the president. This is something that the treasury and the 
Federal Reserve would, would already be doing just in the ordinary course of, of managing their operations. But I do think there's a need to get the public and the Congress behind the technology. And the US has been very slow to engage with digital currency, to acknowledge that it's probably here to stay and to think about modernizing the regulatory system. And when the president put out his order, it was really not just about CBDC and the central bank digital currency, but it's really an attempt to jumpstart the political process to bring more order and logic to the regulation of digital assets. Um, it's not just about Bitcoin and Ethereum and so forth, but I think you're going to see the credit markets, the stock markets transition to using digital tokens, taking advantage of the innovations of the blockchain and the decentralized nature of some of the financial markets they're beginning to observe, to, to emerge. The US has to find a way to engage with this technology. And I think in terms of political leadership, if the president can get Congress to begin to look at the issue more seriously, and to try to put it beyond politics so that this is done by people with expertise and not making it in the US, it's red versus blue, the left versus the right. <laughs> I think fortunately, we're still at a point where this has not become a political football, as we call it. <laughs> and there is still some space for people with knowledge and expertise to lead the US in the right direction. And if the president can play a role in that, I think that's very useful. And the the point of President Biden getting involved, I think, was simply to, to draw attention to it, to get the public to begin thinking about it, and above all, to try to get people in Congress to focus on the importance of doing this right. Exactly. In the end, this is a financial issue. At the same time, it is a political issue as well. Um, I remember last year, Mr. Powell said in a meeting that we won't need either stable coins or cryptocurrencies if we had a US digital dollar. Do you think Bitcoin, stable coins, and cryptocurrencies can still coexist even after the creation of the US CBDC? There's a lot of denial that is persisting, not just in the US. You could go to the BIS in Switzerland, the Bank for International Settlements, and they've made even more extreme statements about how there's no real need to modernize. <laughs> but people are changing their tune pretty quickly. I think the governments in the US and elsewhere have moved more in the last year on this issue than ever before. The, um, the importance of the independent digital currencies, you know, the Bitcoin, the stable coins like Tether, I think there's clearly a clientele and an audience for them, but they're still very small. And I think the technology behind them is not going to accommodate enough growth to make them a serious competitor. The real importance of it is that they've introduced a technology that can be co-opted by the government and by the private sector. And I think this is ironic because the mission of Satoshi Nakamoto, the creation of Bitcoin, was to destroy the central bank. But <laughs> ironically, what it's probably going to end up doing is giving the central bank tools to make it even more powerful. But the social media companies, I think, see great opportunity. They've already seen the success of Alipay and WeChat Pay in China. Facebook got into this business, but then got out very quickly before they could really launch because they faced a lot of political opposition that was directed not at their financial business, but at their main business. But I think you've got companies like Amazon who are sitting and watching this and waiting for the right time. But if they get interested in this, they would have many advantages over the government. And when Jay Powell in the US says that these things are not needed, Maybe not, but I think from the point of view of the shareholders of these companies, it's an opportunity to go into the business of creating money. And they're not going to let this go. I even think Twitter with Elon Musk might think of issuing its own currency. Mm -hmm. um, there are many companies who have the global reach and the technology and the very large number of customers to be real threats to governments and to create currencies that would go very easily across borders. So economists have had a lot to say about the threat from the social media companies, 
And it's not really a question of whether they're necessary. I think you have to acknowledge that they have big advantages in acquiring customers and keeping them on their platforms. They have way better cybersecurity and IT infrastructure than the government does. And at the very least, they're going to provide a threat that will cause the government to you know, really need to up its game and modernize. But I don't see them leaving this to the government. I don't see why they wouldn't consider entering the, the currency business in their own right, given all the comparative advantages that they have. And this, I expect, will be very interesting for the next 10 or 20 years, maybe beyond that. Indeed, it will be very interesting. Thank you for sharing your idea on that. I also do think the US CBDC will be the safest and the most credible digital asset available to the general public. But on the other hand, cryptocurrency with that, they have would have their own role and merits as well. The last question, <laughs> Professor Yuri might be for that. Thank you for accepting and being our guest speaker today. The design and concept of money is rapidly changing these days. We're entering the globalization stage of digital legal tenders. Lastly, it will be great if you could give any advice to our Korean audience regarding this. I think Korea has a lot of advantages. I've seen the rankings of the countries that are the furthest ahead in terms of consumer digital payments and internet adoption and so forth. And Korea is perhaps the number one or you know very close to the top of all the countries in the world. And in general, many of the Asian economies, when you think about countries like Taiwan, Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, um, they have the infrastructure to take advantage of this technology and the willingness of the population to engage with it that will probably give them an advantage. So I think if the Korean government wants to roll out a CBDC, and it probably will, they'll have a much easier time than countries like the US, where we still <laughs> don't have broadband internet in much of the country. And we have a population that still likes to write paper checks. And we have a very antiquated financial system, but Korea is digitally progressive. And I think this will actually help the government move forward with um, modernizing the financial system in a way that essentially saves a lot of money for citizens who can get quicker, safer access. The, the estimates from the Bank of England is that if you roll this out, it could raise the GDP of a country on the order of about 3%. Mm -hmm. And I would expect the Asian economies and Korea in particular to be among the first to take advantage of that. Now, having said that, I think you need to be very careful about cross-border payments, that these things may well travel beyond national borders in a way that the current financial system creates barriers for. So Korea has capital controls. That mm -hmm. I think this is controversial, but it may well be that these instruments provide a way to undermine those. And it may be that there's um, competition from other countries like China and the US to recruit people from smaller countries to use their digital currencies. So I think a degree of national competition that takes a different form than in the past could very well occur. And countries all over the world have to be prepared for this and even think about regional currency unions that we're already seeing, I think, the first of these among the small Caribbean nations. But it may well be that you see regional currencies, sort of like the euro, um, become much more popular and, and more likely to be adopted with the public. So I, I would expect a lot of change, that the nature of money is changing much more quickly now than has been true maybe in any time in history. But I view this above all as an opportunity. There are many good things that can come out of this. And Korea and other countries that are far ahead of the rest of the world digitally are probably in the best position to capitalize on these opportunities. Sure. One more question um, regarding that. Both China and Korea are one of the two of the leading uh, countries for these digital uh, currency. However, both countries have their currency restricted. Do right. you think this will play a role in their CBDC development? I think the Chinese, in particular, have ambitions to have their currency used around the world. You know, to try to compete head to head with the U.S. dollar. 
in the long run, if you really aspire to be a reserve currency, you can't have capital controls. You need to have the free movement of capital and you need global access. They have to be prepared to let people from other countries onboard into their own financial system. So I think the, this is true, not just of Korea and China, but any country that aspires to be an importer and exporter and to have competitive capital markets can't expect to have capital controls that restrict the flow of money in and out of the economy. It's surprising to me, in fact, that Korea still has them because it's a very modern, <laughs> successful economy. I just don't see the need for it. Um, typically, these are for younger countries who have concerns about capital flight, but the Korean economy has grown and become a success, and it, it just doesn't need this. And most of the other economies of similar size and so forth got rid of them a long time ago. So if this provides an opportunity to rethink the need for capital controls, and I think it does, it might you know indirectly lead to a better outcome in, in that area as well. Thank you very much for your time today, Professor Yermak. You got to learn much more about the US CBDC and I appreciate it. Hope to talk to you again in the near future. 네, 지금까지 미주은행 변정규 전무와 미국 뉴욕대학교 데이빗 여맥 교수의 미국 CBDC 도입 추진 현황과 과제에 대한 인터뷰 자료였습니다. 네, 변 전무님 이번 인터뷰 잘 봤습니다. 혹시 어, 의견을 더하실 해설을 해주실 부분이 있다면 좀 부탁드릴까요? 글쎄요, 그 보신 대로요. 혹시 예. 재미 있으셨나요? <웃음> 예, 그 여맥 교수님이. 그 하버드 대학에서 그 박사시기도 하시지만 경제학 박사 그동그 그 하버드 로스쿨에 또 JD 법학 박사시기도 하세요. 그래서 그 금융과 법률 모든 전반에서 굉장히 박학 다식 하시고 또 여러 부분에 대해서 되게 약간 시니컬 하시기도 하시지만 굉장히 이렇게 냉철하게 잘 짚어 주신 것 같습니다. 특히나 그 다양한 형태로 앞으로 이렇게 경쟁이 디지털 커런시 CBDC의 경쟁이 이렇게 개발 경쟁이 심화될 것이다 이렇게 얘기를 해 주셔서 거기에 대해서 참 많은 생각을 하게 된것 같습니다. 네 답변 고맙습니다. 미국의 CBDC에 대한 이해뿐만 아니라 어, 현대 이 커런시 시스템 자체가 대격변기에 놓여 있구나 이런 생각을 할 수가 있었던 시간이었습니다.